it does take an immense amount of commitment. And, and even when things get really rough, uh, you can't give up. So it, it's, it's more than just a job. It's more than an occupation. It's a lifestyle. Business of Architecture, episode 195. Hello, I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the podcast for architects, where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. I'd like to invite you to discover how to double your architecture firm income and create your dream practice of freedom and impact by downloading my free four-part architecture firm profit map. As a podcast listener, you can get instant access by going to freearchitectgift.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the only office and project management software designed specifically for architects. It helps you manage people and projects while you focus on designing great architecture. So whether you're working remotely or on-site, ArchiOffice allows you to monitor the status of your projects and tasks and send out invoices in an accurate and timely manner. Get your fully functional 15-day trial of ArchiOffice by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Today is the second part of my interview with architects Jared Haas and Tim Darrington of Austin, Texas. Tim Darrington is the principal of Darrington Building Studio, a firm focused on community and domestic architecture. Jared Haas is the principal of Unbox Studio, a collaborative modern design studio with some amazing work. Now, several years ago, they came together to form the Eastside Collective, and they actually built out a co-working space for architects and design-focused businesses. In today's episode, they talk about the challenges, successes, and lessons learned along their journey to becoming firm owners. So without further ado, let's get down to business. What kind of promotion do you guys do for the space? Um, it's, it's very minimal. Uh, a lot of it's, it's kind of like architecture. A lot of it's word of mouth references. Um, and, and not, it's pretty important because we're really geared more towards people in the industry and like-minded people. Um, and that's kind of how our best way of finding them. Uh, but we have put up some Craigslist ads. Uh, we, we have some Facebook, uh, ads we're starting to put up now. Um, uh, but, but primarily anytime we get a member, it's generally through word of mouth. It is, and, and about three times a year we have pretty big uh, parties and events uh, uh, that celebrate kind of some some really uh, big cultural things here in Austin. So there's South by Southwest. Uh, we have uh, an East Austin studio tour which celebrates local artists on the east side of town. So uh, with those two events plus just a general summer party, uh, we like to kind of get uh, – not only our, our community as designers, but the kind of local community and other people that are culture junkies to kind of come over here and mingle. Uh, and that has actually helped quite a bit in establishing our, our presence. Yeah, and, and I think there's two things I want to talk about that just kind of happened recently that, that are pretty awesome. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the East Austin Studios tour, uh, but it's basically just, uh, it's, it's almost like South by Southwest, but for artists over on the east side. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, anyone can open up their studio, anyone that registers can open up their studio um, to, it's, it's a free event and anyone could just walk around and enter a studio and just look at artwork. Um, it's it's actually much more intense than that sounds. Uh, there's, uh, I think there's over 500 studios that are open. Uh, who knows how many thousands of artists. Um, and uh, it was kind of a last minute decision. We put this together last year. It happened, coincided with when we opened up. Uh, this year we decided to go a little bit bigger, uh, and what I mean by that is we had um, we teamed up with the co-working space across from us, activated our courtyard, and we had eight different artists uh, that we kind of worked with and selected that were very like-minded. A couple of them were architects, um, uh, and we threw a big party prior to that. We probably had over a thousand people come throughout the night, uh, not to mention several hundred people coming throughout the weekends of the East. Uh, which gained a lot of lot more recognition, um, uh, as well as uh, we had another event this a, a week before, um, and you could probably talk about this because you were more directly involved. But we uh, we, we put together an installation for the Waller Creek Light Show uh, that Tim had designed. Um, like I said, Tim Tim can probably talk more about that. Yeah, and that actually leads into um, another topic. So. There's been a momentum generated with the East Side Collective because it's it's an interesting concept. People tend to like it, and uh, the Waller Creek Conservancy is a nonprofit organization here in town that's um, bringing an awareness to an underserved waterway, 
which is the creek on the east side of downtown. It kind of stretches from a little bit north Austin all the way to uh, Town Lake, which is a river that runs right through the center of town. Um, and every year for the last three years, they have uh, brought together five different uh, artists, designers, uh, to essentially do uh, light installations along the creek to draw the public toward it uh, as a kind of a engagement, spectacle, uh, art, cultural phenomenon. Uh, and it's drawn a lot of traction this year. They estimate somewhere around like nine to 10,000 uh, visitors over the course of two weekends. Um, we were approached as the Eastside Collective. The Eastside Collective is not a design firm, uh, but the Water Creek Conservancy approached us as kind of a one-stop shop for young talent and asked if the Eastside Collective itself would want to be involved. Of course, we said yes. So it was myself and Wilson Hanks, uh, another local designer, uh, that teamed up uh, and then we brought in uh, Drophouse Design, which is kind of a local design slash uh, fab company that specializes in, in doing kind of awesome metalwork. Uh, so the three of us, under the guise of Eastside Collective, designed a, a giant aluminum arch that we installed in the creek, uh, right off in downtown, and it was it was lit up. It was uh, 30 feet tall, 60 feet uh, in diameter and got a lot of reviews. In fact, we were even on uh, uh, Design Boom featured there. Contemporary? Contemporary as well. Um, we've got a couple of magazine publications that are going to have us featured as well. So somehow, we started off as... Most importantly, it'll be in Burning Man. Yeah, and it's also moving on to Burning Man uh, 2017 next year uh, as, as an art installation there. So it's funny, this started off as just sheerly uh, utilitarian, a way to save some money uh, between it a couple of friends. It evolved into uh, an organization that's now fostering young, young talent at a uh, reduced cost that it would otherwise take for you to have your own office, and has transitioned into being a design resource for uh, the community. So uh, that it's been a fun experience along this weird path we're on. Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. It gets easier, I think. Uh, it started off pretty hard. It was a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, but it's definitely getting easier and, and more and more fun by the minute. Anything else about the formation of this co-working space that we haven't touched on that you think would be valuable to talk about in terms of the process or the challenges? Yeah, I think we should we should probably mention a couple of the, uh, the challenges along the way. And I think it sounds like we've already talked about the benefits of how having this, thing, this culture we've created and now it's kind of doing its own thing out there. But I mean, if there are people out there that are interested in doing this for themselves, you should probably be aware of some of the difficulties we've encountered. So Jerry, you probably have some thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I would almost recommend, um, unless they really wanted to, uh, to, to do this full-blown operation uh, to, to share a space, kind of like how we started off. Uh, what I mean by that is our life was a lot easier. We're much more able to focus exclusively on our, our, our businesses uh, our architecture practices, design practices. Um, uh, now it's 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 definitely a lot, it's definitely time consuming. Even with three partners um, and an admin, uh, it's still very time consuming. Uh, it requires a lot of work. Um, you're you're never done. It's just like any business. You're never done. Things are constantly moving. Um, uh, there's a lot of member dynamics to deal with. Uh, uh, legal legal things that are just constant. Uh, Things always come up. Even planning for events, it's a lot of work, uh, and and not that it's not fun. Uh, it just takes away from 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 our primary practices. Um, but there's definitely a lot of reward in that. Uh, you know, as we discussed, kind of, uh, I think the biggest rewards are kind of having that culture and having like-minded people in your office, uh, as opposed to working from home, uh, having uh, events, uh, doing things. We have happy hours quite often. Um, we'll go out to Juice Land right down the street quite often together. Um, uh, you know, we have an event coming up next week where one of our members is actually in a jazz band and he's doing an improv soundtrack to uh, an art film. Um, so people just kind of approach us uh, as a space uh, to do things like this. We have, we have uh, often other than outside of East, we have um, frequent artists that come in and display some work and we'll feature them as well. Um, so it's... It's, it's, it's fun, but it's definitely a lot of work. Yeah, and if I were to add to that, I'd say that, um, you know, we knew that when we got into it, forming an LLC, and was there was work. Uh, we knew that we'd have to deal with attorneys so we understand exactly what we're getting ourselves into, all those things. But the thing that I think surprised me the most 
was just managing the dynamics of all the different members and personalities that come along with uh, having several ambitious young people in the same place. Uh, because you tend to assume, or at least I have, you tend to assume that a lot of people already just kind of understand uh, things that may or may not be explicitly stated. Um, and then when, when people don't and they have other expectations that they're totally entitled to, it just kind of catches you off guard and you have to start thinking in terms of uh, this isn't just hanging out with your friends, this is actually managing something that can affect other people's lives. Uh, so it, it, it kind of, it was much bigger than I originally uh, was anticipating. I'm, he, I'm, I'm, I'm sensing there's a story behind that comment, Tim. What's the background? <laughs> well, what is the background on that one? I, I don't know. That's a really a particular incident. I think just, uh, it's like Tim said, everyone's different. Everyone has their different needs and you just have to accommodate their ex expectations. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I think I mentioned earlier that it started off as a very organic process and it still kind of is. I mean, it's, it's probably 80% organic, 20% calculated. Um, uh, but that 20% calculated doesn't really account for everything. So we're constantly evolving, trying to make sure we account for member needs. Um, uh, someone may, you know, be fine with what we have. Someone may want something else. If they want that something else, uh, how do we accommodate? Um, so you know, we're, we're constantly growing. We're 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 adding on, and like I said, it, it gets easier, but there's it doesn't stop. Um, and I, I think of that as a, as a good way. Some people, once you sit still and you have someone kind of prodding you to to add something else. Uh, we're not going to add it. Add it if we don't feel like it benefits the the entire collective. Um, so so it's uh, it's kind of nice. Yeah, and and I'll give you a little tidbit. I mean, without getting into every little detail, but you know, we we try to maintain a certain aesthetic. You know, as architects, it's, it's important to be represented by the things that are around you, including the space, furniture, just whatever it might be. Um, Jared tends to be very minimal. I tend to be fairly minimal. Uh, so sometimes people want to you know, put big posters on the wall or, you know, display a bunch of stuff on their desk. And they should be entitled to that. But at the same time, where's that line between too much stuff that doesn't represent the overall collective and, uh, and not enough personal freedom? So those are things we just never would have expected. And it's, it's actually a good exercise to have to learn how to not only set people's expectations, but uh, learn how to uh, be flexible with your own personality. And it's, it's also, it's, it's working with people as well. You know, we have an interior designer that's coming in here um, starting in January, but she's actually coming in to install some shelves and rearrange some of the space. Um, and, and it's great. I think that's a great benefit to us. So, so you know, we have to be very accommodating and, and vice versa. Um, so, like I said, I think it's more beneficial uh, to be flexible than, than not, for sure. Absolutely. Well, thanks, guys, for sharing what it took to pull this uh, the East Side Collective together. It's pretty, pretty great story. A lot of good information. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks for having us on. Really appreciate it. I'd like to jump in now into your both individual practices and talk about what it's been like to grow and more of the practice side of things. So let's transition away from the the collective and let's talk about your individual businesses. So just quickly tell me, Jared, what is your business focus? Uh, so, Unbox Studio, uh, we're a collaborative design firm. Um, we do modern architecture. Uh, we're general practitioners. We do uh, things from, we do a lot of uh, residential spec projects. We'll do some custom residential projects, uh, commercial projects, uh, and that can really range. I mean, for example, we're working on a, uh, a, a high-end boutique hostel cafe event space uh, we're doing a tenant finish out uh, for, for someone, a warehouse tenant. Um, uh, we're doing a volleyball facility center out in Maynard, Texas, uh, which should be really interesting. Uh, so we're kind of all over the map. Anything, um, it's really about the client. Uh, we're, we're really about trying to find those like-minded creative people that really want to push the envelope and work with them. And what prompted you to start your own practice, Jared? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think it was a, more of a product of the economy. I was working for a firm downtown. Um, uh, it was, I actually really enjoyed working for the firm. Uh, they went a full year without even signing the contract, and so they had mass layoffs. Um, right after, or shortly afterwards, I started working for another firm. Um, 
great firm, uh, uh, just wasn't a good fit for me, uh, and it really prompted me to want to go on my own. So uh, I left there to start consulting with another firm uh, while I was trying to pick up projects on my own. Uh, and it was pretty tough for me. I was, I was still relatively new to Austin. Um, I didn't really know a lot of people, so uh, I was picking up, uh, I guess, bottom feet and work off of, off of other people, um, other architects and people that I knew. Uh, so uh, I was actually at one point designing some websites, taking on small porch projects and additions, uh, and, and I think the first, the first two larger projects that I landed, uh, one was a, uh, it was an addition and remodel to an existing house out in the suburbs, um, and uh, that got landed into House Magazine, uh, and I got a couple more projects from that, and then at the same time I was working on a Lake Austin cabin project. Uh, and that got picked up by Dwell and some several other magazines, um, and that kind of put us on the map a little bit, so to say, uh, and launched us into uh, other projects. So, Jared, where have you found your work? Where are you getting your work from? Um, it's it's basically a network of people that I've built up over the past couple of years. Uh, it's uh, it's it never comes from one source. Um, uh, it's it's always you know, and I'm sure you're very familiar with uh, with everyone telling you kind of the same answer, but it's it's really true. Um, we we can we can market some things, um, and that's one one aspect of it. Uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, when someone comes to us, they they know about us several different ways. That's what really secures people to us. There's a lot of other architects in Austin. Uh, people tend to interview and talk to a lot of other people, but uh, it's it's usually um, a contractor. Uh, a, a former client uh, or even a current client um, that that recommends us uh, but if uh, someone knows us through hey uh, I saw your project going up down the street from us uh, or I saw an article that you guys have posted uh, or I remember seeing your uh, something in, in dwell magazine um, that's usually what kind of blocks it for us tell me about a time what was the most challenging part about starting your firm Jared um, other than everything, um, I think started from scratch, going from zero to where I'm at now, uh, is, has been the toughest, uh, part, uh, and not only that, I think, uh, just constantly evolving, trying to grow, trying, trying to do, uh, different, different things all the time. Um, I've really bought into the whole, uh, Jonathan Siegel model, and right now we're, uh, me and one of my employees are looking to partner up and, and develop our first product in the first quarter of this, uh, this coming year. Um, so that's a that's a whole new challenge, a whole new can of worms. Um, uh, but even trying to operate the firm and, and trying to continue to grow, uh, we're looking to hire somebody. That's always difficult. Um, uh, sometimes just getting that steady work is always difficult. It, it's it's very rare that uh, that the work comes in steadily. Uh, it's either all or none a lot of times. Um, uh, so so it's it's always it's always something. It's it's a very I guess it's, it's just a very dynamic uh, business in general. Tim, tell me about your firm. Sure, my firm, Darrington Building Studio, started about six years ago. Um, we, we focus on uh, community and domestic architecture, and why do I say that? It's because we're a boutique firm, and you know most boutique firms try to get uh, small-scale projects. but that's almost an insult to the, the client that's hiring the architect because no project's really small to anybody. It's always a big deal. Uh, so community and domestic um, is our focus. So high end residential, custom residential, as well as any kind of a commercial space that fosters uh, one form of community or another. Uh, two examples of uh, the kind of community architecture we've done. Uh, we've done a, a, a private elementary school that uh, was kind of built around a Montessori uh, ethos along with uh, a very uh, uh, holistic teaching style. So uh, they really let us get into the details of, of how to really reinvent a space for them. We've also done a rock climbing gym here in town. Uh, rock climbing culture is very strong. And it's, it's, it was intended to be uh, the kind of uh, headquarters of their, of their culture for the, for the city. Uh, so we started six years ago, not too different from Jared. The, uh, the great catalyst was the Great Recession. Um, I was let go of, uh, from my job. I was there for five years. 
uh, just because there was not enough money to go around. So, of course, I couldn't find a new job. No one was hiring. Uh, I took odd jobs freelancing for you know bathroom renovation or whatever it would have been. Uh, I joined a, a, a startup company uh, doing design work for them and just kind of bumbled my way through with no intention of being a business owner. Uh, but as I did one job after the next and found out that I really enjoyed it, uh, found out that I liked the challenge not only of being an architect but figuring out the business of architecture um, was was just too much fun. Of course, it's a lot of work, but it's also um, quite a liberating experience. To when you get it right, it feels great. What so that was kind of the. the I was just going to ask, what were your, what have been your key, both of you, your key takeaways in terms of the business side of architecture for the past five or six years? What are the key, if you had to sit down and say, look, you're take, speaking to someone, you know, who's going to become an architect or thinking about starting their own firm, what are the top lessons that you would share with them? Hmm. I might, I might give a couple. Uh, the first one is uh, cultivate your relationships. The only way you get work in this business is for somebody to trust you very much. Uh, there are plenty of other architects out there, so somebody has to trust you quite a bit. And also, um, really think through as much as you can all the time the systems you use uh, to run whatever it is you're doing, be it a freelance or a small firm or mid-size or large firm. Uh, in fact, I've got a, I'm, I'm part of a small startup right now uh, that's that's trying to um, uh, improve the software that people use uh, to run their firm. So we're offering a, a platform alternative to what's currently on the market. So yeah, that's that's what I would say. Hey, tell us about the platform because we'll want to watch that and there may be some listeners who want to check it out. Sure. Uh, we're calling it Studio Map and it's... Um, I, I can't so tell you which software I've, I've used in the past, but it's one of the two big ones that's out there. And the problem with that software is that it's, uh, it's it feels very outdated. It's very hard to extract metrics once you get the once you figure out how to put data into the system. It's hard to extract metrics on the fly, uh, and it's just difficult to use and expensive. So I had a friend that was working with um, uh, a legal startup company doing this sort of thing for small uh, law firms. And I complained enough about what I was doing uh, that he, he decided to take a look and try to help me figure out the system I was using. Uh, he and a couple of his uh, tech people took a look and realized that actually it wasn't necessarily my fault, it was just not the best system because they were using uh, Salesforce as their, their kind of the spine of their operation, which is nimble, um, uh, affordable, and quite sound as a, as a uh, platform. So we used Salesforce as the kind of uh, base and then built off of that. And for me as the architect, I wanted a couple of things. I wanted it to, one, be easy to use, and two, be as automated as possible because the ones we were using weren't very automated. So we did that, and then the third part of that was that it had to be incredibly visual. The metrics had to be beautiful and visual, and we needed to be able to see uh, all the information we needed to know quickly and beautifully. So that was that was that. Um, we are, I think, next week going to have the LLC for Studio Map. We're uh, courting architects here in Austin to, to get through the beta phase. Uh, and once that goes through, then we're going to launch, hopefully within the next year, develop the app so that it'll be all in one uh, and geared specifically towards small to mid sized firms. That's fantastic. We'll check it out. So in other words, in, in other key key business takeaways, anything either of you want to add to that? Um, well, I think you kind of hear this a lot on your podcast, but I, I think um, kind of back to your original question about uh, advice to people starting their own business practice and venture, um, I, I think uh, make sure you do it for the right reasons. And what I mean by that is uh, actually practicing architecture itself and designing buildings, uh, it's a uh, it's it's very it's a very small portion of what we actually do as business owners. Uh, you're pretty much a business owner first, and then you get a designer and architect second. Um, so that being said, uh, you really need to go on that with that right mentality. Uh, for me, it's it's really about trying to hire the right people, the the, the people that are like-minded, the people that have the similar design aesthetic, similar values, 
um, because they're going to be the ones that are actually doing the work uh, and also interacting with clients. Um, while I'm trying to uh, do a lot of the marketing, handle the day-to-day -day operations, uh, being a small practitioner, there's there's a lot of work. Uh, there's a lot of accounting, um, uh, uh, you know, marketing, as I said. Um, just just daily operations, we rarely get to actually dive into the building process and design process itself. Cool, Tim. You want to add anything to that? No, I think that was uh, the points I made earlier. And along with that one, I couldn't agree with it more. I mean, it's it's a lifestyle, obviously. Um, you know, if you love architecture, that's that's great. That's a component of it, and that's got to be the foundation of the reason why you do this. But at the same time, you also have to uh, embrace all the other aspects of it. Um, so, exactly what Jared said, what I said earlier. It's it's just it's it's a lifestyle. It's practically a religion. You have to wake up every day and do it until you go to bed, and then do it all over again. Why do you say that it's practically a religion? Because uh, it takes. Uh, now, of course, I don't mean to offend anybody, but it does take an immense amount of commitment, and, and even when things get really rough, uh, you can't give up. So it, it's it's more than just a job. It's more than an occupation. It's a lifestyle. And there's, there's really blurred lines between uh, your your personal life and your business life. Uh, they're they're pretty pretty well merged once you go out on your own. That's true. Fantastic. Well, guys, thanks for joining us on the Business of Architecture. We really appreciate it. And just to finish up here with this interview, I'd like to both ask you something. Just to travel back in time, if you were to sit down with yourself you know, five or six years ago when you were starting this process, what would you tell yourself? And we'll start with Jared. Uh, I would have told myself to uh, read some more business books. Uh, I, I think the, the reason why I actually found Business of Architecture was because I didn't know a lot about the business of architecture uh, and primarily being the, just business in general. Um, uh, I, I didn't go to business school. I went to architecture school. Uh, so, uh, And through this podcast, I've actually discovered a lot of great books out there that I would recommend to myself five years ago for sure. Do they come off the top of your head? Can you give us a couple of them? Yeah. Uh, um, I'd say the first one I start off with, was when it came out was the uh, the Steve Jobs. I don't know if that was recommended on, on here or not, but that was uh, a really informative book about just the the, the product. Uh, and then uh, Good to Great was one of the first, uh, uh, I guess, series of books that I read uh, based on uh, a recommendation from one of your podcasts that kind of launched me into all these other books. Um, yeah, I think they, those, those were probably the two of the biggest for sure. And, and, and uh, E-Myth is another one that I just read recently that was um, uh, given out by one of your podcast uh, guests um, as well that I, that I would highly recommend to someone that's starting off. Or Actually, I would recommend that to anyone in the business of, uh, of anything, actually, because uh, it's a whole different series. And, and uh, uh, the, the one for architecture is really, really relevant. Awesome. Tim, how about yourself? If I were to go back, I'd say, go for it. Don't. It's going to be fine. It's harder than you think, but it's not nearly as hard as you think. You'll figure it out. So, uh, when I started, it was uh, I was terrified of, of uh, failing, primarily in uh, losing money and going in debt. Um, so what? You got to try it. So that's what I would have said. Um, and uh, your interview with Tom Main was also a really nice one because uh, he kind of, you know, this is obviously the business of architecture, but he kind of just said, don't worry too much about the business. It's all about, it's all about the product. It's all about believing in, in, in the thing that you love, which is architecture. So believing in that and not having any fear, yeah, so go for it. Very cool. Tim Darrington and uh, Jared Haas, thanks for joining us on Business of Architecture. Thanks, Enoch. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks again. Okay, talk to you later. Bye-bye. Right, cheers. And that is a wrap. Thank you for listening today. If you're looking for more time, freedom, impact, and income as an architect, get instant access to my free four-part architect profit map by visiting freearchitectgift.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the only office and project management software designed specifically for architects. It helps you manage people and projects while you focus on designing great architecture. So whether you're working remotely or on-site, 
ArchiOffice allows you to monitor the status of your projects and tasks and send out invoices in an accurate and timely manner. Get your fully functional 15-day trial of ArchiOffice by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world.